So Jackson, brief introduction. And uh, actually, you just got back from a trip. You had an in-person debate with Dr. Dino. Lots of fun. And so how have you been? Yeah, go ahead, Jackson. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So about finding marine and terrestrial things together, uh, you, you do sometimes. I've, only done, I've, I've been to a lot of fossil sites in Arkansas and one now in Alabama. And uh, I've only found one fossil site where I could find terrestrial and marine things together. Like the rule seems to be that's that you find terrestrial things in one spot and marine things in one spot. For example, I found a, a ridge near near me, like 20 minutes away. It's got these chordites. It's got these uh, calamites by the hundreds, but uh, never any marine fossils there and uh, never any, let's say, bamboo or oak leaves or modern plants. So it's the same for Northwest Arkansas, the Fayetteville Shale. It's all marine. Never found any anything like uh, a plant fossil there. Uh, same the Eocene of Arkansas and the Eocene of Alabama. It's all marine. The one exception was in Archie Creek, which is about an hour north of me. I found like 99% marine fossils. Then I found a couple of these uh, uh, Cordites leaves in some, in some shale. But that was the one exception to that rule. So, uh, what, what do you guys think of that so far? Sure. Joe? Well, um, you find that the, well, <laughs> in the nicest way to say it is that, um, and I'm very blessed to have been doing this for a number of years now where I have traveled extensively, both across the US and the UK and Australia, uh, as well as many other places in, in, in Europe as well. And um, you could start reeling names of deposits off. Solnhofen is a very good example of marine and uh, terrestrial environments that are mixed together. Jurassic Coast down in the UK, again, you can walk along the base there and and many, many people who have no background in geology, purely amateurs, just fossil hunters, walk along there and you find heaps of wood buried next to ammonites. It is, in essence, the norm. Um, you can do the same with the rocks, the Jurassic rocks in Australia. You can do the same because if you come slightly further along from that deposit that you were describing with the Equisetum and the like in to where we were in Tennessee, just the sort of the next sort of state along, it's the same deposit, the same uh, Mississippi and Pennsylvanian deposit. I think it's Pennsylvanian. It's yet yeah, uh, upper Carboniferous. Um, you'll find there are sharks buried next to these. So going a little bit wider than just one or two deposits is a, a, good, a good idea. Fair okay, enough. I'll add a comment here, Joe. One of the things that our friend is missing is if I find buried equisetums or buried leaves, I have to stop and say, if this is a terrestrial deposit, how did these get buried? In every case, it's flood deposits that mud has come in, covered up the equisetums to the whole depth, 20, 30 feet, 10 meters tall, and then preserve them. So you have a watery deposit and you have no idea if it's salt water or fresh water, except when you're like me and you find brachiopods in with the coal, along with shark's teeth just at the other end of the the, um, the, the coal deposit. And the re in reality, most of what you're saying is superficial investigation. So I'd encourage you go back and, and plot your area in squares and then check up the microscopic fossils. Are they marine forams, terrestrial forams? What are they? But forget the idea of having fossils from a terrestrial environment unless you build in a flood dumping over the top of that to preserve the equisetums, et cetera. All right, let me, let me talk about micro fossils since, since you mentioned. E either way, if you take the, uh, the ecologic zonation or the hydrologic sorting model, uh, it, it seems to me that you're, you, you know, con con conodonts are, but they have a little teeth, they, the micro fossils, conodont teeth, they're from the Cambrian, the Triassic, which doesn't exist apparently, but anyway, they're from the Cambrian to the Triassic. And, uh, Sharks have dermal denticles, which are about the same density and size. And they sharks will shed millions of those in their lifetime. And there are billions of sharks any one time. So you would expect to find both conodont teeth or elements. They're not true teeth, but conodont teeth and uh, shark dermal denticles in like the Cambrian. 
But when you look at microfossils of the Cambrian, you never find dermal denticles. Why would you think that would be? Joe, any comments? I so you're the you're and we just check check that you've got the the thing like you the 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 question is effectively if you've got it all from the same flood why don't you find shark teeth or dermal things in the in the in the Cambrian effectively if it's all the same mixed type uh, well, of environment? Not, not exactly it's that you should find conodont conodont teeth and shark scales together because they're essentially identical in density, size, and they even look kind of similar. And of course, sharks live all over the world. There's not really an environment in the ocean they don't live in. So you're th you're you so that you're th you're going from the the idea is that you would have fossils buried based on their density. So if you find things of the similar density, then you should find them buried together in the hydrologic sorting model. But it also applies to uh, eco uh, ecologic zonation because sharks live everywhere in the ocean. Can I suggest that our listeners, um, if they want to follow up on how sediments get there, go to our Jurassic Arc dot, uh, our creationresearch.net and look up strata machine experiments because what you've got is three or four things happening here that you're lumping into one thing. You're killing the sharks, you're, you're having their teeth fall out, you're having the conodonts, and you're then mixing them up and dumping them in the same place based on density. Now, that's such an outdated idea, it doesn't even warrant too much of a, of a reply. But if you want to I'm see... Saying, I'm not sure we've ever claimed like, that it's based on dense density. If you want to see what a flood is like, have a look at our strata experiments where we introduce different density stuff, and then fl we flood it along, and you find one thing the uh, strata is within a fraction of a, 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 an instant of leaving a source and it's already sorted. It really it is fascinating to watch. But in Noah's flood, you would not only have the fountains of the deep breaking up to start with, you'd have rain uh, coming down, you'd have two tides a day, you have hundreds and hundreds of events in a year, um, drowning, sorting, all of those, and your sharks, of course, are still swimming happily around in the sea. Now, when you have a look at the fossil record, uh, despite the fact that it would be true if you take the Cambrian rocks, you don't find any rabbits, as Mr. Dawkins says. Why is that not the case? Why don't you find sharks and conodonts? Well, frankly, I haven't got a clue in some of these as to why you don't. But I can tell you where you do find them. You find whole sharks, not just the teeth, whole sharks in the Kentucky coal fields, buried with the plants that are terrestrial. And the, and as I said, my, my spe fantastic specimen of a brachiopod mixed in with the ferns. So that is the reality of what you do find dealing with not what you don't find, but what you actually do find. All right. I, I found uh, about, about brachiopods. I found three species of brachiopods in uh, one area of the Fayetteville shale, shale which is carboniferous. And uh, they were identified as all being endemic to the carboniferous. Like why, why are there no brachiopods from the Eocene in there also? Joe, you want to comment on how we classify it as the Carboniferous? You didn't hear me? Well, perhaps I will then. You when you say we found them endemic to the Carboniferous, number one, we've got the reverend gentleman in England calling the rocks around Newcastle Carboniferous because they've got carbon in, and they've also got brachiopods and things like that, even though it's a coal bed sequence. And you actually use the brachiopods to determine where you are in the coal because I lectured to the Newcastle Coal Board in England and took them out and we did fossil studies on the, using the layers of fossils to determine where you are in the geologic column. And the reality is if you say it's endemic to the Carboniferous, you mean it's found in a particular area and that is classified as Carboniferous, so you lump them all as living at the same time. In reality, they're dead in different layers in the same area. That's the fact. All right. Now, my next thing that I, I have written down that, that kind of bothered me was about the geologic column and how you, how you guys were saying it can't be found anywhere. And are you aware of the, the Williston Basin? Mm-hmm. You are? Uh, there are about 20 or 30 other examples like that. But the Williston Basin has Precambrian to 
basically present pretty much every everything's there and it's in order as you would expect it and uh, they've done they drilled cores and found fossils in these cores and they you know they found cambrian and ordovician trilobites they found uh carboniferous era or devonian era rather conodont teeth and they found plant fossils up up higher that are endemic to that area so not only are the layers in line in, in this spot but the fossils are too are you asking a question oh, I'll just make a statement. well it was kind of a statement but i mean what are, what are your thoughts on that okay number one you will find that when you drill those holes down you do find order no doubt about it in that hole right you can't drill that hole here in queensland where i'm sitting because you've only got three layers and and they're scattered left right and center but if you actually ask the next question because our next step is to say this represents six seven hundred million years from the top of the precambium up to the present whatever is is there i can't remember the exact details each year since i've looked at that drill call but you'll find that if you then ask two things one is what percentage of the actual geologic column is there and the standard answer was well every bed is there no wrong answer when you actually say let's take the amount of rock that's there x kilometers or whatever it is divide it by the supposed time and you will find that 98 percent of it is missing yes we have layers that you can put in order based on the fossils but you'll find the percentage of rock that's there is minimal compared comparatively and so therefore please don't say that we've got rock that, that represents hundreds of millions of years of geologic column or geologic history because not even the complete columns have any more than a couple of percent of supposed history the rest is missing if you don't believe me take the depth and then say if this represents 600 800 million years whatever you want it to do and divide the depth by the actual 600 million years and ask how much rock was laid down each year and you'll find the answer is less than the size of an oil molecule. So the time is not represented in that, at that column, no matter what you do. That's what Derek Ager is famous for. And even though he was not a creationist Christian, the reality is I admire that guy because he stood there and he said, here we have this much rock. It represents this much supposed time, divide one into the other. And the answer is plainly ludicrous, quote unquote, from his book on the new catastrophism and i'd really recommend our readers grab a copy uh derek age a new catastrophism it's worth looking at uh do you believe the, the depth might have something to do with erosion and deposition rates like they might be different over different times well the thing is that being involved in field geology so much it's fairly easy to pick erosion if you wander around here at the moment on the top of the metamorphic rocks that I'm sitting on, you can tell erosion because there are hills, there are valleys. And even if I covered all that up with a flood, I would still largely preserve the geomorphology of the land underneath. But what you find is the top layers are unbelievable. They just merge one into the other. And you can actually establish because there's no oxidation at those boundaries. There's no production of uh, iron oxides or soils or anything like that. And so you are not looking at deposit then massive erosion then deposit then massive erosion you can rule that out and that's how Derek Age reached his position there is no evidence of time in these rocks these rocks here are, are well ludic ludicrous results if you want to see check for time all right so the, the layers are kind of mapped out when they're not in perfect order like the Williston basis basin they're kind of mapped out it like uh, on geologic maps in the U.S. I don't know how they do it in Australia, but you can go to uh, any area. Like you can go to the Eocene of Eastern Arkansas. There's this little narrow strip, and find anything, and it fit and it fits there. Like I found this this clam. I didn't know what it was. It turns out it's called Venericardia planticosta, and it's only found in the Eocene. What are the odds? Do you think of me finding it in that narrow strip of exposed? Eocene strata of eastern Arkansas and not say the exposed Carboniferous strata. Let's forget the fact that you don't think they're different ages or whatever. Just what are the odds of that? Okay, uh, perhaps a couple of things and then Joe you can throw in a comment. I ask first of all how did it get to be Eocene 
And the answer is when Charles Lyell started to dominate the geologic thinking, number one, his philosophy was get rid of Moses. Number two, start classifying the rocks on the basis of the fossils that were in it. Number three, invent words like Eocene, meaning that, you know, the, the new the new dawning uh, sort of uh, formation, and then use a fossil that you select as an index fossil and then state wherever you found that, it must be Eocene. Now, there's four steps there away from reality. The reality is the first Eocene was where Charles Lyell de declared it. He wrote the definition. Everybody follows it from then. So wherever you find that that nice plenty cost us, you say it's Eocene. Well, see, the, the problem with that is I knew it was Eocene. I didn't know it was plenty cost. It could have been anything. Yes, it could have. But it's Eocene because it already had that stuff in it. Well, I don't think they, they map every piece of land in the U.S. out like that. I think they, they do. They those. certainly they certainly label them on the basis of fossils because you, you go and do your master's, you do your PhD in geology, and you learn how to classify something, and you look for index fossils. And you don't worry about the rest of them. You look for index fossils, and you list it on your geologic map. One of our guys in the USA, he was sent out as a, a young geologist, and he had to map the Cumberland Plateau, and he wanted to know who the expert was. And they said, well, from now on, it's you. So he would then consult the fossil sequences and whatever he found, he would use that as the indexing for the labeling there. But the point that this debate sort of got sidetracked, we're dealing with the evidence in rocks. Now, none so far has pointed to any evidence of evolution. It has definitely pointed to rapidly covering up fossils, terrestrial fossils particularly. And you and I need to sit down and say, no time, rapid fossils, no evolution. Where do we go now? I mean, I mean, I feel like we're kind of at the end of our rope with this conversation, this line of uh, the fossils in order and, and stuff. 